Deputy Lieutenant of Worcestershire, civic dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. As President of the First Shortland District Branch of the Royal British Legion, I have the honour to welcome you to this service of acknowledgement of the outbreak of the Great War. 100 years ago, on the 4th of August 1914, the Great War, later known as World War One, touched the lives of all communities across the country, whether large towns or rural areas like Pershaw and its surrounding villages. Pershaw sent a fifth of its adult population to the war. Of the 460 men who went, 101 did not return. Many of the local men were only teenagers. Some families lost fathers, sons and brothers to fight in the war, and life changed dramatically. Women played their part by taking over men's work, whether in farms or factories. Some volunteered to nurse the wounded, both here and at the front. Animals were involved in the war too. Local history indicates that horses were requisitioned from our surrounding farms. Many of the men who went to war may never have been away from Pershaw or their village before. And this alone must have been frightening. even before the horrors they are about to face in active warfare and in the trenches. While many were sent to France, others were sent on ships taking many weeks to reach faraway destinations such as the Middle East. We read of the condi conditions the men fought in. There were also new weapons of warfare with bombs and gas causing horrific wounds and illness. It is difficult for us today to comprehend the scale of the destructive effects of the war. What we do know is that there was much suffering during the four years, both for the men fighting and for their families at home. Last month, we were invited to join the pupils of the Abbey Park Middle School for a service of remembrance to mark the beginning of the war. The pupils had been learning about what had happened to local people in the war. They read poems and each one memorised and read the name of one of the fallen. It was a moving occasion. Today, we honour and thank the people who went and did not return. The people went and who came back wounded and may have been prisoners of war the resulting physical and mental scars affecting the rest of their lives. When the names of the Roll of Honour are read, many of us will, will recognise local family names and relatives. We are marking the acknowledgement of the outbreak of war, but we will be remembering key events and battles over the next four years. In 2018, we will finally be able to celebrate the armistice of the 11th of November 1918. Peace and freedom, but sadly only for two decades. The Reverend Mark Jenkins will now lead our service. We gather here today in the heart of Pershaw and representing its people, standing together in solemn assembly to mark the anniversary of the British involvement in the cataclysmic conflict often referred to as the Great War, a war which was vainly anticipated to last just a few short months, but which in its ugly, raw, and unspeakably harsh realities 
engulfed much of humanity in a conflict of unprecedented proportions for more than four diabolical years, during which time an estimated 17 million soldiers and civilians were killed, and many, many more maimed and scarred, bodies and minds blown apart, hearts and homes torn asunder. Amid the horrors of such enormous pain and unimaginable human suffering, such pitch darkness was pierced and lit by many examples of self-effacing but truly immense courage, of personal heroism and costly sacrifice. It is right that we join with others from across the home nations, across Europe and around the Commonwealth to share in our own simple but poignant act of solemn remembrance, mixing as we meet lament with thanksgiving, sorrow with pride. We will soon hear the names read from Pershaw's own Roll of Honour, listing the names and the surnames which are still signed and heard in and around our town, a clue to the family connections which abide, names to be read and remembered, heard and honoured, and by so doing will bring the events of 1914 through 1918 close to home, and with it the enormity, the reality of the sacrifices that so many of our townsfolk were forced to endure during World War I. There have and there will yet be multiple acts of shared commemoration across Europe. For example, in Belgium, at Mons, where both German and Allied service personnel are buried side by side in grounds graciously gifted by the Belgians, the only differentiation being the grey contrasted with the white headstones. I do wonder what the respective lists of war dead from our twinning towns of Bad Neustadt in Germany and of Plouet in France might look and sound like. Might we remember them too? There have been deeply moving examples of symbolism, invoking memory, drawing tears, allowing otherwise immensely private, painful stories to begin to be discreetly shared and now many decades later publicly honoured. In our capital city, ceramic poppies as a river of blood are filling the dry moat of the Tower of London in memory of those who lost their lives a total which exceeds more than 888,000 will be planted, with the final one being laid on the 11th of November. Last Saturday in my home city of Birmingham, we witnessed an unusual piece of commemorative artwork as an army of 5,000 individually sculpted ice pieces were laid on a flight of steps in Chamberlain Square and left to melt in the sunshine which now pierced the previous dark rainy morning. Each one lovingly hand sculpted, personally decorated, everyone invested with memory, thus highlighting a century on those personal stories in which the memory of men and women and not just soldiers whose lives were taken during the conflict May I encourage you to do something special for one hour from 10 o'clock this evening, in the hour that precedes the actual time of the declaration of war at 11 p.m. Share with us in the, the Royal British Legion's Lights Out event. Let it be that households and businesses and public buildings across our town and across the United Kingdom will turn their lights off and leave a single candle or a single light on. Inspired by the words of the wartime Foreign Secretary 
Sir Edward Grey, who said on the eve of war, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. We must recognize the enormous losses, huge economic cost, and unprecedented political upheaval that was triggered by an unexpected assassin's bullet in distant Sarajevo. In my own quiet times, I found myself lamenting the seemingly endless and senseless horrors and continuing carnage of contemporary conflict. I surely need only mention the names of places like Gaza and Mosul and Tripoli and the U Ukraine to make the point. And in my quiet times also I have reflected upon the words of Jesus as he wept over the city of Jerusalem and foresaw its impending desolation, crushed. He spoke plainly words through his tears and with a tightness in his throat. He said this, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. With hindsight, it is clear that politicians failed to discern factors which were endangering peace in Europe and thus leading for war. But they did not, and too often we do not. And surely there remains in our world the tendencies that need to be exposed and addressed that could lead to conflict but can be transformed into peace. You and I, we, may feel powerless to shape a nation, let alone our world. But we may and we can and we must, by God's help, shape our own personal responses. We can surely weed the garden of our own hearts and apply by daily choices the discerning of what makes for peace. It may be a random act of kindness. It may be an intentional act of forgiveness, the letting go of a grudge, the releasing of enmity, and the relating positively to another. In recognizing what makes for peace, this can be our gift to the world, and it can go viral. It can impact for good our neighborhoods and our nation. And in our locality, this can be our little light that pierces the shadows and dispels the darkness. This could be our sowing of the seed of peace. This must be our discerning of what makes for peace. Purposeful, Christ-like gestures, meeting the needs of others, showing hospitality, not retaliating but returning bad behavior with good, coming in the opposite spirit, breaking the cycles of nastiness that dominate so many relationships and distorts and detracts from the opportunities for partnership, for sharing and support. My prayer, I trust our prayer, is that we may live in the gift of God's peace, that we may experience and share His wholeness, that we may, that we may allow His Holy Spirit to permeate our hearts and minds, empower us to live in ways that make for peace, for wholeness of home and heart, of community and conscience, in fleshing the reality. May our prayer be, begin here, Lord, begin with me. Amen. Let us now come to God in prayer. We come to remember members of our families long since dead, some who returned forever altered, and some who did not, but whose legacy reaches out through this past century. We remember the faith which was tested, sometimes beyond breaking. We remember broken bodies, sometimes beyond repair. We remember landscapes 
still pockmarked by the devastation of gunfire and even beyond peace. We remember the widows and the orphans, sometimes beyond grief. We remember the eyes destroyed beyond the gas attacks. We remember the white feathers, sometimes beyond patriotism. And we present our thoughts and our prayers and our commemorations into the eternal arms whose ever-present strength and love is here as it was then and always will be. Almighty God, through your love the universe and this world were formed and sun and stars were set in their courses. In love your Son claimed us as your children and through the power of the Holy Spirit the future that you have planned for us is revealed and assured. We know your purpose is that all should live as sisters and brothers. On this day we declare our sadness that the history of our world is so marred by failure to live in peace and that injustice, tyranny and oppression are ever rife. Remind us that you still give us your call to show courage when danger threatens, fortitude in the face of loss and pain, hope when tempted to despair, and perseverance in defense of right values. We give thanks for those who an example in their standing fast for the ways of truth and justice, and who held nothing back as they strove to uphold freedom and secure our peace. Forgive us our failure to be all that we should be. Instead, refashion us into loyal servants of your cause, that your kingdom of peace may indeed be established through all the world to the glory of your name. And we gather our prayers as we share the prayer our Saviour taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A poem of remembrance. The soldiers marched off one by one to do the job that had to be done. Your country needs you, the posters said, but no one realized what lay ahead. They gave their lives to protect us all. With a willing heart, they answered the call. The battles raged and so many men fell. Would anyone come home with tales to tell? We must never forget the price they paid, what selfless sacrifice the young men made. As the years marched silently by, we must remember why they chose to die. They fought for us so brave and true, so let's all give them the thanks they are due. Remember them as we silently pray that peace will descend on the world one day. Remember with thanksgiving the true and faithful men who in these years of war went forth from this place for God and the right. The names of those who returned not again. Charles Andrews, James Andrews, Reginald Andrews, James Annis, James Archer, William Askew, John Bagnall, John 
Barber, William Barber, Oliver Barnes, Harry Beard, Arthur Biddle, Oliver Burt, Arthur Bozard, Alfred Brandt, William Bridgewater, Arthur Buckle, Bertram Carter, Francis Charles, Harry Charles, William Checkets, John Clark, Albert Caldicott, Alfred Caldicott, Thomas Coldrick, Harold Kong, George Cosnett, Henry Cosnett, John Cosnett, Thomas Cosnett, William Crook, Albert Dancox, Robert Deakin, Water Dolphin, Herbert Dufty, William Dufty, Walter Edwards, Sidney Fell, Henry Fletcher, Alfred Fulcher, Henry Garrett, Frederick George, Albert Giles, Arthur Giles, John Grinnell, Joseph Grinnell, John Grundy, Arthur Hall, Ernest Hall, George Hammond, George Hans. Frank Harbord. Ernest Haynes. George Haynes. William Hitchings. Douglas Hook. Arthur Hudson, Aubrey Hudson, Edward Hughes, Philip Hunt, Albert Jones, Arthur Kings, Arthur Langford, Cecil Lutchington, Nicholas Mann, Charles Marshall, Edward Marshall, Kenneth Mason, Arthur Mayo, John Miller, Harold Mosley, Leonard Mosley, Arthur Moulton, Hiram Moulton, William Mumford, John Mead, Douglas Nutting, Edward Palfrey, Francis Priest, Ernest Price, William Pring, Hubert Pugh, Thomas Pugh. Charles Reeves, Robert Reeves, William Richards, Thomas Roper, Morris Saunders, Henry Smith, John Smith, John Critchley Smith, Percy Smith, Harry Stanton, Charles Sermon, William Taylor, Ralph Tinson, John Townend, 
Charles Twig, Leonard Twig, William Winwood. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. May God the Holy Trinity guard and defend you on every side, strengthen you to face times of difficulty, and keep you rooted in faith, hope, and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen. Before we dismiss the parade, um, could I just thank all the civic dignitaries, Her Majesty's, Her Majesty's representative, um, the Deputy Lieutenant, and you're all invited afterwards to the Royal Naval Club for tea, buns, and anything that you may require. Once again, many, many thanks. Pray, Commander, you dismiss the parade. <laughs>